as if mass internments, brainwashing, forced labor, forced sterilizations, and organ harvesting weren't enough. Muslim women are being tortured and gang-raped at Disney-approved Chinese re-education camps. Apparently, giving the world coronavirus was but one of the arrows in China's quiver of destruction. I was reading the Open Doors 2021 World Watch List, which evaluates the extent of Christian persecution in various countries, and I noticed that China moved up in the rankings. It went from the 23rd worst place to be a Christian to the 17th worst place to be a Christian. Here's a short description of what life is like for Christians in China. The church in China continues to enjoy strong growth, However, life for Christians is anything but straightforward. The policy of sinicizing the church, sinicizing something is to make it more Chinese, but in this context has more to do with making something more communist friendly. The policy of sinicizing the church has been implemented nationwide as the communist party limits whatever it perceives as a threat to its rule and ideology. Thousands of churches have been damaged or closed. In some parts of China, children under the age of 18 aren't allowed to attend church, part of the country's efforts to stunt future growth. So, we've got communists who are attacking whatever threatens their rule and ideology, trying to stunt the future growth of the church. But communists aren't just anti-Christianity, they're anti-any religion that promotes belief in God and an afterlife, which is why the Disney-approved Chinese government has been rounding up Muslims and sending them to re-education camps. Now, I've seen people in the comments section saying things like, Oh, China really knows how to deal with Muslims. They're not putting up with Islam. But before you put your stamp of approval on China's re-education camps the way Disney did, let's read about what's happening to women in these camps. The BBC reports, The men always wore masks, Tersenai Ziwudun said, even though there was no pandemic then. They wore suits, she said, not police uniforms. Sometime after midnight, they came to the cells to select the women they wanted and took them down the corridor to a black room where there were no surveillance cameras. Several nights, Ziwudun said, they took her. Perhaps this is the most unforgettable scar on me forever, she said. I don't even want these words to spill from my mouth. Where are these communist men in suits taking these Muslim women? Are they taking them to watch Mulan? Let's find out. Tersanai Ziawudun spent nine months inside China's vast and secretive system of internment camps in the Xinjiang region. According to independent estimates, more than a million men and women have been detained in the sprawling networks of camps which China says exist for the re-education of the Uyghurs and other minorities. Human rights groups say the Chinese government has gradually stripped away the religious and other freedoms of the Uyghurs, culminating in an oppressive system of mass surveillance, detention, indoctrination, and even forced sterilization. The policy flows from China's president, Xi Jinping, who visited Xinjiang in 2014 in the wake of a terror attack by Uyghur separatists. Shortly after, according to documents leaked to the New York Times, he directed local officials to respond with absolutely no mercy. The U.S. government said last month that China's actions since amounted to a genocide. China says reports of mass detention and forced sterilization are lies and absurd allegations. This is actually a standard tactic when a dominant group wants to crush and oppress a smaller group in brutal fashion, but is worried about how that oppression will be perceived. In order to justify extreme oppression, you wait for someone in the smaller group to do something violent. Then you oppress everyone in the group. You say, we have to respond with absolutely no mercy in order to protect ourselves from these dangerous people. And of course, our crackdown is going to include torture and rape. 
First-hand accounts from inside the internment camps are rare, but several former detainees and a guard have told the BBC that they experienced or saw evidence of an organized system of mass rape, sexual abuse, and torture. Tersenai Ziawudun, who fled Xinjiang after her release and is now in the U.S., said women were removed from cells every night and raped by one or more masked Chinese men. That could be a TV series in communist China, The Masked Rapist. I'm sure Disney would be happy to produce the show. She said she was tortured and later gang-raped on three occasions, each time by two or three men. Zia Wudun has spoken to the media before, but only from Kazakhstan, where she lived in constant fear of being sent back to China, she said. She said she believed that if she revealed the extent of the sexual abuse she had experienced and seen and was returned to Xinjiang, she would be punished more harshly than before. And she was ashamed, she said. That's another common tactic. The Chinese communists know they're dealing with women who are ashamed to talk about being raped. So they rape them, knowing that most of the women will never talk about it. Internal documents from the Kunis County Justice System from 2017 and 2018 provided to the BBC by Adrian Zentz, a leading expert on China's policies in Xinjiang, detail planning and spending for transformation through education of key groups, a common euphemism in China for the indoctrination of the Uyghurs. In one Kunis document, the education process is described as washing brains, cleansing hearts, strengthening righteousness, and eliminating evil. My goodness, it's like the Chinese government is going through a PowerPoint presentation on the tactics of oppressors. Tactic three, what you're doing is raping and torturing women. How do you describe that on paper? Cleansing hearts, strengthening righteousness, eliminating evil. We're raping and torturing these women for the greater good. The BBC also interviewed a Kazakh woman from Xinjiang who was detained for 18 months in the camp system who said she was forced to strip Uyghur women naked and handcuff them before leaving them alone with Chinese men. Afterwards, she cleaned the rooms, she said. My job was to remove their clothes above the waist and handcuff them so they cannot move, said Gulzira Owl Khan, crossing her wrists behind her head to demonstrate. Then I would leave the women in the room and a man would enter, some Chinese man from outside, or a policeman. I sat silently next to the door, and when the man left the room, I took the woman for a shower. The Chinese men would pay money to have their pick of the prettiest young inmates, she said. So, Chinese communists are paying for the privilege of raping the prettiest Muslim women. Some former detainees of the camps have described being forced to assist guards or face punishment. Awa Khan said she was powerless to resist or intervene. Asked if there was a system of organized rape, she said, yes, rape. They forced me to go into that room, she said. They forced me to take off those women's clothes and to restrain their hands and leave the room. Some of the women who were taken away from the cells at night were never returned, Zia Wudun said. Those who were brought back were threatened against telling others in the cell what had happened to them. You can't tell anyone what happened. You can only lie down quietly, she said. It is designed to destroy everyone's spirit. Mr. Zenz told the BBC that the testimony gathered for this story was some of the most horrendous evidence I have seen since the atrocity began. This confirms the very worst of what we have heard before, he said. It provides authoritative and detailed evidence of sexual abuse and torture at a level clearly greater than what we had assumed. Notice, we all assumed that these communists were raping and torturing these Muslim women, but we didn't know it was this bad. Alongside cells, another central feature of the camps is classrooms. Teachers have been drafted in to re-educate the detainees, a process activists say is designed to strip the Uyghurs and other minorities of their culture, language, and religion, and indoctrinate them into mainstream Chinese culture. Telbiner Sedek, an Uzbek woman from Xinjiang, 
was among the Chinese language teachers brought into the camps and coerced into giving lessons to the detainees. Sedek has since fled China and spoken publicly about her experience. The women's camp was tightly controlled, Sedek told the BBC, but she heard stories, she said, signs and rumors of rape. One day, Sedek cautiously approached a Chinese camp policewoman she knew. I asked her, I have been hearing some terrible stories about rape. Do you know about it? She said we should talk in the courtyard during lunch. So I went to the courtyard where there were not many cameras. She said, yes, the rape has become a culture. It is gang rape, and the Chinese police not only rape them, but also electrocute them. They are subject to horrific torture. That night, Sedek didn't sleep at all, she said. I was thinking about my daughter, who was studying abroad, and I cried all night. So, the Chinese communist men raped the Muslim women at night. Then, during the day, the Chinese communist men send the Muslim women to classes where the Muslim women are taught about how great Chinese communist culture is. Another teacher forced to work in the camp, Syragul Sayutbe, told the BBC that rape was common and the guards picked the girls and young women they wanted and took them away. She described witnessing a harrowing public gang rape of a woman of just 20 or 21 who was brought before about a hundred other detainees to make a forced confession. After that, in front of everyone, the police took turns to rape her, Sayyid Bey said. While carrying out this test, they watched people closely and picked out anyone who resisted, clenched their fists, closed their eyes, or looked away, and took them for punishment. The young woman cried out for help, Sayyid Bey said. It was absolutely horrendous, she said. I felt I had died. I was dead. She felt like she was dead, and she was just a witness. This is commentary from a teacher about witnessing a public gang rape in a Disney-approved re-education camp. According to Zia Wudun's account, the perpetrators did not hold back. They don't only rape, but also bite all over your body. You don't know if they are human or animal, she said, pressing a tissue to her eyes to stop her tears and pausing for a long time to collect herself. They didn't spare any part of the body. They bit everywhere, leaving horrible marks. It was disgusting to look at. I've experienced that three times. And it is not just one person who torments you, not just one predator. Each time they were two or three men. Later, a woman who slept near Zia Wudun in the cell, who said she was detained for giving birth to too many children, disappeared for three days, and when she returned, her body was covered with the same marks, Zia Wudun said. She couldn't say it. She wrapped her arms around my neck and sobbed continuously, but she said nothing. Raped and tortured for three days straight for the crime of having too many children. Obviously, this isn't something women forget about once they're released. Many in the community had turned to alcohol, Zia Wudun said. Several times, she saw her former cellmate collapsed on the street, the young woman who was removed from the cell with her that first night, who she heard screaming in an adjacent room. The woman had been consumed by addiction, Zia Wudun said. She was like someone who simply existed. Otherwise, she was dead, completely finished by the rapes. They say people are released, but in my opinion, everyone who leaves the camps is finished. And that, she said, was the plan. The surveillance, the internment, the indoctrination, the dehumanization, the sterilization, the torture, the rape. Their goal is to destroy everyone, she said. And everybody knows it. Those are some passages from the BBC article. There's a lot more. I'll link to the article in the description box in case you want to read it. So, to those of you who think that China has come up with the correct formula for dealing with Muslims, are you serious? Do you really think that rape and torture are appropriate responses to ideologies you have a problem with? Let me ask you, what is your objection to Islam? I have several. Apart from Muhammad being the most obvious false prophet in history, my main objection to Islam is the way it dehumanizes people based on their beliefs. So what sort of hypocritical moron would I be if I condemned Islam for dehumanizing people based on their beliefs, but then I praised Chinese communists for dehumanizing people based on their beliefs? 
I don't like Islam because it oppresses people who are my brothers and sisters in humanity. Not just my brothers and sisters in Christianity, my brothers and sisters in humanity. One God created one humanity, whether you believe it or not. We're all related. If your ideology oppresses my brothers and sisters, well then, I have a problem with your ideology. Right now, as you're watching this, communists are raping and torturing some of our sisters in humanity. And if you approve of that, I don't see how you're any better than any group you hate. Now, as for you Muslims who are watching, why are you not more upset about what's going on in China? If one Israeli soldier did this to one Palestinian Muslim prisoner, there would be international riots. But Chinese communists are torturing, gang raping, and forcibly sterilizing Muslim women. And I see Muslims condemning it in some tweets and videos, but the level of outrage doesn't seem to be proportional to the atrocities that are being committed. Why is that? Is it because lots of Muslim countries have lots of business dealings with China and they don't want to rock the boat and hurt their revenue, so Muslim politicians are sacrificing Uyghurs on the altar of their bank accounts? Priorities, am I right? Speaking of revenue, according to the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, the Chinese government has facilitated the mass transfer of Uyghur and other ethnic minority citizens from the far west region of Xinjiang to factories across the country. Under conditions that strongly suggest forced labor, Uyghurs are working in factories that are in the supply chains of at least 82 well-known global brands in the technology, clothing, and automotive sectors, including Apple, BMW, Gap, Huawei, Nike, Samsung, Sony, and Volkswagen. When Western nations make laws about business dealings with China, guess who throws a tantrum? We can see in the New York Times. Nike and Coca-Cola lobby against Xinjiang forced labor bill. Business groups and major companies like Apple have been pressing Congress to alter legislation cracking down on imports of goods made with forced labor from persecuted Muslim minorities in China. The super woke companies that are constantly lecturing us on ethics, Nike, Coca-Cola, Apple, Disney, they have no problem with making money from forced labor in China or with praising the Chinese government. If you tweet the wrong thing, they'll try to destroy your life. But they love working with Chinese communists who are torturing and raping Muslim women. If I didn't know better, which I don't, I might conclude that these companies don't care at all about right and wrong. They only care about dollars and cents. The leaders of these companies sat down in a boardroom and concluded that the best way to make money in America, given the direction we're heading, is to go as woke as possible, while the best way to keep their costs down is to use cheap Muslim slave labor in China. These CEOs are some of the most despicable people on the planet. They have no business lecturing any of us about anything, and they deserve to be mocked into obscurity the moment they point a moral finger at anyone. As a final note, and this is something for all of us to think about, we look at the atrocities of the past and we wonder, how did people sit back and let that happen? We think, if only we had been there, we would have stopped those people. And yet, when a country that will soon be the world's top economic superpower starts sending people to concentration camps and using slave labor to make the products we buy, the entire world looks the other way. Because interfering with the concentration camps would affect too many profit margins and raise the prices on our iPhones. So now we know how people in the past sat back and let atrocities happen. They let the atrocities happen because they were more concerned with being comfortable. Are we any better? We'll know soon enough.